Hey squad, welcome back, and if you're new here, welcome to the channel. Today I'm looking at one deceptively simple question. Is Manwe doing a good job ruling Arda? Some figures from Middle-earth's history are as beloved by fans as they are by other characters. People seem quite comfortable reading descriptions of the famous courage of Luthien, the loyalty of Samwise Gamgee, or the renowned wisdom of Elrond. Other times, though, a disconnect occurs between how a character is described or portrayed in Tolkien's writings and how readers experience them. One such case is that of Manwe, the Elder King himself, Lord of the Breath of Arda and Chief of the Angelic Valar. On paper, Manwe's got a lot going for him. Second in might only to his deranged brother Melkor, Manwe rules Valinor and indeed all of Arda from atop the holy mountain of Teniquitil. With his spouse Varda, the Queen of the Stars, at his side, he sees further than all other eyes, through mist and through darkness and over the leagues of the sea. He commands the great eagles who carry out his will in Middle-earth, and holds the allegiance of all the other Valar, to say nothing of the elves and men who revere him. Described as the dearest to Iluvatar, and the one who most clearly understands his purposes, during the music of the Ainur, Manwe was the chief instrument of the second theme, the primary opposition to the discord of Melkor. With all of these sterling qualities, you would think that the guy would have a suitably impressive list of accomplishments to his name, earning him at least a grudging respect from even the most die-hard Feanorian partisans. But as Middle-earth's history progresses, Manwe gives the impression of someone who doesn't do all that much. And when he does intervene, a lot of people argue that he has a terrible track record. It's Manwe who makes the final decision to unchain Melkor after his three ages of imprisonment are up, even though many of his fellow Valar are strongly opposed to the idea. Though he appears repentant, Melkor uses this opportunity to inflict dreadful harm, corrupting elven society and turning the sons of Finwë against each other. He ultimately escapes Valinor, eludes his brethren, and returns in secret to destroy the two trees, kill Finwë, and steal the Silmarils. With the Noldor on the cusp of violent revolt after this tragedy, Manwë advises prudence and caution, but fails to offer any alternative ways for them to seek the redress they understandably crave. Neither does he do much to really slow them down, even as their haste to be gone plunges them into deadly conflict with the Teleri of Alqualondë. After the Noldor leave, he shuts Valinor against them. And it's not until the coming of Eärendil that the Valar take any further direct action against Morgoth. After the War of Wrath and Morgoth's overthrow, Manwë gives the remnants of the faithful Edain of Beleriand the island of Númenor to dwell in as a reward, increasing their power and wisdom with aid from Amun itself. But predictably, this also swells the Númenorians' pride. Manwë's quite reasonable ban on any attempts to sail to the Blessed Realm become the center of the Númenorians' defiant obsession with escaping death, which leaves them ripe to be exploited by Sauron, who is, by the way, still at large because the Valar once again failed to deal with them when they had the opportunity. Faced with the consequences of his decisions, in the form of a full-scale naval invasion, Manwë pulls the ultimate cop-out by laying down his governance of Arda, along with the rest of the Valar, and leaving the sinners of Númenor in the hands of an angry Eru. By the time the War of the Ring rolls around, the Valar are still receiving lip service from the most theologically observant inhabitants of Middle-earth, but their actual involvement is more limited than ever. For all Gandalf's talk of mysterious forces manipulating reality to oppose Sauron's designs, at this point the people of Middle-earth mostly have to get on with the business of defeating Sauron on their own, often at staggering costs. With the stakes as high and the consequences as grave as they inevitably become, many readers get quite frustrated with what they see as Manwë's fatal ineffectuality. Even characters riddled with grave moral failings, who make objectively terrible choices, 
can end up garnering more sympathy than the vaunted King of Arda, simply because they're visibly putting in at least some kind of effort. In order to fairly evaluate Manwe's successes or failures, the first step is to get really clear about what his role is even supposed to be. We have to approach this carefully because there's a natural tendency to view the Valar through a human lens, but the Valar are very explicitly not humans, and the relationship between Manwe and the rest of Arda's inhabitants is not the same as the one between rulers of elven, dwarven, or mannish realms and their subjects. Manwe is not king over elves or men, he's king of Arda itself. The Valar are not the despots of the world, but its very lifeblood. Their job is to control Arda's forces and substances down to the minutest detail, and accepting this mission was not entirely without drawbacks. This condition Iluvatar made, or it is the necessity of their love, that their power should thenceforward be contained and bounded in the world, to be within it forever until it is complete, so that they are its life and it is theirs, and therefore they are named the Valar, the powers of the world. Elves and men, and dwarves by adoption, are a different story. They are the so-called children of Eru, because they proceed directly from the thought of Eru himself. Not only do the Valar have no right to interfere with them, they don't even really understand them, at least not in the same way that they do the natural forces that they sang into being. Four elves and men are the children of Iluvatar, and since they understood not fully that theme by which the children entered into the music, none of the Ainur dared to add anything to their fashion. And if ever in their dealings with elves and men the Ainur have endeavored to force them where they would not be guided, seldom has this turned to good, howsoever good the intent. Now that's not to say the Valar don't have any responsibilities toward the children, they definitely do. The children of Eru are in many ways the driving force of Arda's history, and after the discord of Melkor some believe they are its only hope of ultimate redemption. Without elves and men, and yes eventually dwarves, to introduce things like desire and will, the mechanics of Arda, no matter how complex, are ultimately kind of pointless. So the first duty of the Valar is to govern Arda in such a way that the children can live and act which entails everything from creating the conditions necessary for life at the Earth's beginning, to maintaining the ongoing physical and causal elements and processes of Arda that men are inclined to refer to as chance, but that the elves identify as Ambar, an element of fate or destiny. As the king of Arda, and chief of the Valar, Manwe is responsible for directing this operation. But that's not the only thing he has on his plate, he also has to defend the very theme itself from his rogue brother Melkor. We're told in the Valaquenta that Manwe was appointed to be, in the fullness of time, the first of all kings, lord of the realm of Arda and ruler of all that dwell therein. This makes Manwe's rule sound preordained, but all the same the first time he's known to have taken on that role is in a very specific circumstance as the leader of the second theme, raised to oppose the discord during the Anulindale. Within Ea, Manwe emerges as the leader of the Valar opposing Melkor during Arda's early formation. When therefore the earth was yet young and full of flame, Melkor coveted it, and he said to the other Valar, This shall be my own kingdom, and I name it unto myself. But Manwe called unto himself many spirits, both greater and less, and they came down into the fields of Arda and aided Manwe, lest Melkor should hinder the fulfillment of their labor forever. And Manwe said unto Melkor, This kingdom thou shalt not take for thine own wrongfully, for many others have labored here no less than thou. A key thing to notice in this contest is that Melkor is the one who makes the initial claim to control Arda and everything in it. Manwe's objection to this is formulated on behalf of everyone else involved. So within Arda as we know it, with the insidious effects of the discord already in play, Manwe's role is to safeguard the creative liberties of everyone against Melkor's solipsistic tyranny. In a relatively rare example of viewing his mythology from the outside, Tolkien observed that Manwe's potentially apocalyptic degree of might and majesty limits his usefulness as a character. He, like Melkor, practically never is seen or heard of outside or far away from his own halls and permanent residence. Why is this? For no very profound reason. The Elder King is obviously not going to be finally defeated or destroyed, at least not before some ultimate Ragnarok, so he can have no real adventures. 
but if you keep him at home. The issue of any particular event can remain in literary suspense. When we move out Monwe, it will be the last battle and the end of the world. What makes this ironic is that in Monwe's case, this observation almost perfectly mirrors the constraints of his role within the context of Arda. To keep the story of Arda's history in motion, he has to create the conditions for the other players to act. Which means that uniquely within Arda, Monwe's main goal is to avoid enacting his will on others, even his fellow Ainur. As far as resisting Melkor goes, Monwe's job is not to centralize his authority or realize a competing vision of his own. Instead, it's to make sure everyone else has the maximum opportunity possible to pursue their own agendas, in keeping with the collaborative nature of creation within the bounds of the great theme. Hints of this can be seen in the description of his character and role in the Silmarillion. Manwe Sulimo, highest and holiest of the Valar, has no thought for his own honor and is not jealous of his power, but rules all to peace. He was appointed to be the vicegerent of Iluvatar, king of the world of Valar and elves and men, and the chief defense against the evil of Melkor. There is a definite trade-off required in accepting this role. Sure, the works of Melkor are as creatively bankrupt as they are unpleasant, but his single-mindedness allows him at least the semblance of masterful efficacy, and this is compelling enough to lure even some of the Maiar, notably Sauron, to his service. Manwe, on the other hand, frequently has his hands tied by the very nature of his position as the platonic ideal of permissiveness. Related to this is Manwe's characterization as the one closest to Eru, who most clearly understands his plans. This trait is simultaneously his main qualification in assuming rule over Arda, and his chief weakness in executing the requirements of the job. In a world where the thought of Eru, the source of the great music itself, has become distorted, it makes sense to defer to the person with the greatest knowledge of how things were meant to be. On the other hand, in Arda Mard, by definition things are not the way they were meant to be, so while it's necessary for Manwe to adhere as closely as possible to the hypothetical ideal scenario, it often leaves him baffled in the face of phenomena that seem glaringly obvious to those with less rarefied perspectives. When Melkor is granted pardon, many of the other Valar are unhappy with the decision, seeing through Melkor's deceptions. Manwe, however, seems convinced otherwise. It seemed to Manwe that the evil of Melkor was cured, for Manwe was free from evil and could not comprehend it, and he knew that in the beginning, in the thought of Iluvatar, Melkor had been even as he. Among the Valar we do indeed see an example of the kind of pragmatic foreknowledge that Manwe seems starkly lacking in. Mondos, the doomsayer, who can see every result of a certain decision in advance. He forgets nothing, and he knows all things that shall be, save only those that lie still in the freedom of Iluvatar. But the very fact of that knowledge binds him to a sort of ultimate neutrality. You can't really make decisions in the face of what is inevitable, and still less can you safeguard everyone's free exercise of will by telling them in detail what the outcomes of their choices will be. So Mandos is constrained to speak only at Manwe's bidding, and the actual job of holding ultimate benevolent authority has to go to someone like Manwe, who can't always predict how things are going to turn out, but is guaranteed to always be acting with the best of intentions. All of this shows that Manwe is beset by paradoxes. He's been put in the role of opposing his elder, more powerful brother's crushing domination, a role that in some respects should never have been necessary. By its very nature, this role requires that he lead by taking a back seat, to the greatest extent it's possible to do so without jeopardizing the fabric of reality. By virtue of his deep understanding of the thought of Eru, he is both the only choice for the job and uniquely ill-suited to it. On top of this, he's living in a timeline in which nothing is consequence-free, and more often than not, there are no good options. Instead, it's up to Manwe to choose the least damaging one. At several points, Tolkien recognized that the judgments of the Valar could be perceived in a less-than-flattering way. In his earliest Middle-earth writings, the imperfections and character flaws of the gods themselves are much more apparent, and it's either outright stated or heavily implied that they are sometimes guilty of neglecting their duties in some cases due to personal pride or selfishness, in others because they've grown lax in their vigilance against potential threats. 
As Tolkien's world evolved, the Valar acquired a remote air of otherworldly wisdom and nobility, and Tolkien took some pains to clarify that what might seem like glaring missteps to casual observers might look more complicated from the Valar's perspective. Considering their generally hands-off approach, he wrote, This appearance of selfish faineance in the Valar in the mythology as told is, I think, only an appearance and one which we are apt to accept as the truth, since we are all in some degree affected by the shadow and lies of their enemy, the Calumniator. Elsewhere, he provided specific defenses of some of Manwe's more controversial decisions. In an essay dealing with the power of telepathy, the elvish narrator, here associated with the character Pengolod, admits that in the histories indeed we may be amazed and grieved to read how, seemingly, Melkor deceived and cozened others, and how even Manwe appears at times almost a simpleton compared with him. In particular, the choice to release Melkor after his original sentence ended seems at best to be running an unnecessary risk. But, Pengolod points out, it's easier to criticize this decision in hindsight than it is to come up with a viable alternative. How otherwise would you have it? Should Manwe and the Valar meet secrets with subterfuge, treachery with falsehood, lies with more lies? If Melkor would usurp their rights, should they deny his? Can hate overcome hate? The release was according to the promise of Manwe. If Manwe had broken this promise for his own purposes, even though still intending good, he would have taken a step upon the paths of Melkor. In that hour and act, he would have ceased to be the vicegerent of the One, becoming but a king who takes advantage over a rival whom he has conquered by force. Tolkien also commented on the decision to shut the rebellious Noldor out of Amun, though Tolkien says the closing of Valinor against the rebel Noldor, who left it voluntarily and after warning, was in itself just, it can still come across as needlessly vindictive. Later writings expand upon this point. As far as concerns the Noldor, they obtained precisely what they demanded, freedom from the sovereignty of Manwe and therefore also from any protection or assistance by the Valar, or indeed any meddling with their affairs. Great and grievous as was the revolt of the Noldor, it was only a part of the griefs and anxieties of Manwe, only one aspect of his heavy kingship, the war against Melkor himself, which had now broken out again into new malignance. The account in Myths Transformed expands on some of the ways the Noldor's rebellion could have intersected with Manwe's other, uh, anxieties. If we consider the situation after the escape of Morgoth, we shall see that the heroic Noldor were the best possible weapon with which to keep Morgoth at bay without provoking him to a frenzy of nihilistic destruction. And in the meanwhile, men came into contact with a people who had actually seen and experienced the Blessed Realm. The last intervention with physical force by the Valar may then be viewed as not in fact reluctant or even unduly delayed, but timed with precision. This perspective is in some ways even less flattering to Manwe, painting him not as an ineffectual and naive figurehead, but as a calculating and ruthless chess master. However, it's not as though Manwe isn't affected by even such arguably necessary sacrifices. In The Silmarillion, it's told that when the messengers declared to Manwe the answers of Feanor to his heralds, Manwe wept and bowed his head. But at that last word of Feanor, that at least the Noldor should do deeds to live in song forever, he raised his head as one that hears a voice far off, and he said, So shall it be, dear bought those songs shall be accounted, and yet shall be well bought, for the price could be no other. The tears of Manwe aside, you wouldn't be alone in considering some of these rationales a little bit… strained. But even Tolkien's least convincing defenses of the Valar are important, because they show Tolkien engaging with the question of just how different the Valar's perspective would be from that of Middle-earth's other inhabitants. All the same, even Tolkien may not have been entirely satisfied by them. In some of his late and more experimental writings, he returns to the question of the Valar's missteps, notably the apparent lack of faith shown in their overly cautious approach to the early conflicts with Melkor, and their excessive meddling with the elves. He also concluded that while Manwe might have the purest of intentions, his impeccable virtue doesn't preclude the possibility of limitation and error. Every finite creature must have some weakness, that is, some inadequacy to deal with some situations. It is not sinful when not willed, and when the creature does his best, even if it is not what should be done as he sees it, with the conscious intent of serving Eru. 
Furthermore, the evolving question of Manwe's role and his relative success in it is very closely related to the different ways Tolkien conceived of Middle-earth itself. In the earliest writings, the potential for danger, destructiveness, and even violence was inherent to everything in Arda, even its noblest characters. In these first writings, the world is a little wilder and more unpredictable, but also, from a moral perspective, a little more comfortable to contemplate. When the gods themselves are routinely mastered by their own passions, the bad things that happen, however tragic, make sense. In later writings, the good characters of Middle-earth attain much higher degrees of wisdom, benevolence, and fortitude, but this carries some disturbing implications for the role of fate within Arda. It's one thing for catastrophes to occur when the majority of characters are routinely making short-sighted or outright selfish choices. It's quite another when even some of the mightiest characters are striving to do everything right by a set of inhumanly high standards and it's still not enough to undo the inevitable tragedy of existence itself. In this regard, Manwe reminds me a lot of Frodo, who also technically failed in his mission and is sometimes criticized for doing so. One way to answer the question of what is Manwe even doing as the King of Arda is to say that he's doing the same thing Frodo did, the best he can, knowing all the while that it won't be enough but hoping that through some path that even the eyes of the eagles can't detect, the world will yet prove to be worth the effort of its making. If you enjoyed this exercise in Manwe apologetics, you are probably one of the Vanyar, but you're welcome to subscribe in spite of that. If, on the other hand, you are more Noldoran in your inclinations, I would recommend you check out my video Debunking the First Kinslaying before you make any rash decisions. The idea for this video was proposed and selected by my supporters on Patreon, where I will later be posting some bonus facts about the Elder King. If that interests you, click the link in the description to learn more. Thank you to everyone for watching, and special thanks to my patrons, especially Dr. Newton Wen, Boy Sophies, John H. Austin Jr., Gandalf the Grey, Marcel Ribeiro, Nick Riallo, Jeremy Buckingham, Dorwin Gray, Brendan Mooney, Kevin Gilstadt, E. Rose B., Allison Kreutzberg, Frankie Twelve String, Luke, Joel Bion, Rogue Hot Pocket, and Jared Carver. 